Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Welcome in this room. Um, we're going to talk today a little bit uh, about cooling capacity uh, of water. I will start with introducing myself. Uh, my name is Ruud van Liemt. No problem, come on in. Take a seat. Um, I work in the, the fire department of Brabant Noord, uh, mainly in fire prevention in chemical industries, uh, but I also have a a hobby that's called calculating fires. Whenever I have some time spared, I like to calculate fires. So I also uh, do some calculation on cooling capacity. Um, and at last, I'm also a volunteer firefighter. I'm a commander at the fire department of Schijndel, um, medium sized uh, uh, village, 23,000 uh, residents, uh, about 100 uh, <coughs> alarms uh, every year. Um, and no large amount of nice fires, but we all have that problem, I think. Um, I told you today we're going to talk about cooling capacity of water. Uh, I will try um, to make it clear whenever something I say is from uh, research and whenever something I say is from uh, is my own opinion. I think it's important to make that difference uh, because, well, Early on this morning we heard about the guy with the big mustache and the guy with the big mustache is saying it's this, uh, well, um, we need to know if something is reliable what somebody is saying. I don't, don't, I don't say every research is reliable, uh, but there's a difference in something that's been researched, peer-reviewed or something that's just my opinion. If it's not clear if it's from research or what I'm saying, uh, please ask me and I will explain it. Also, if there are any other questions, uh, please tell me so. Uh, I will try and, and answer them. I want to start uh, with a picture. Um, I want to do a, well, let's say a little quiz with you. Um, if you think uh, this is enough cooling capacity or suppressive capacity, um, you can stand up. If you think it's not enough water to suppress the fire, you can Sit down. Can you half stand up? Yeah, cool. it depends. So. Because it depends. Yeah, it depends. Yeah, That's yeah. true. Well, uh, you were standing up. Yeah, it depends on the time. Okay. Uh, maybe explain a little bit more. No, if you want to have uh, a knockdown, it's not enough. Okay. But if, uh, if you have time, then uh, the fuel will, uh, will go less and uh, it will be enough. Yeah, okay, but then, well, we have to define what suppression is. Uh, well, my question was, is this enough water to suppress the fire just by putting water on it? And another thing is suppressing fire because the fuel runs out. And those are two different things. Well, you're right. If you have time, the fuel will run out and then you will, might have enough water. Um, but, well, in this case, just putting the fire out with this amount of water will not work. Just to be sure that you are awake, I've got another picture. If you think this is um, not enough water, sit down. No, it's the other way around. If you think this is enough water, stay down. If you think this is not enough water, stand up. Oh, I'll just check in if you were awake and you were not sleeping. Okay. Yeah, it depends. Again, halfway. Yeah, it's true. Um, just before I start the, the official part of the presentation, I want to ask you a question. Um, what do you expect to get out of this workshop? If you leave here in about an hour, um, what knowledge do you hope to have gained? Because I can, well, maybe shift a little bit between a few sides of looking at cooling capacity. Can you help me with what you want to know? Cooling capacity inside a smoke. Okay, so cooling the smoke layer. Yes. Okay. Uh, maybe something at first. Have you, 
anybody over here has have you ever suppressed a fire by cooling the smoke? No, you don't put out the fire by just cooling the smoke. Um, so I won't be talking too much about cooling smoke today. Is that okay? No problem. Okay. No problem. Everything is interesting about fires. Yeah, that's true. It's always great to look at, so. Any other thoughts on what you want to... When you talk about, when you use the word suppress, yeah. do you translate that as to total extinguishment? Just picking up on the, how you answered that question there. Mm -hmm. is, are, are you, when you use the word suppress, is that to extinguishment or is that just to, to suppress? Is it a literal translation? Well, um, in order to fight a fire in a transitional attack, it might be enough to um, let it die out a little bit, not to totally extinguishment, then go in. But in the order of this um, workshop today, we are mainly talking about uh, estimating the heat release rate, um, estimating and, and taking that to how much water do I need and what are the backgrounds on those things. And we are not talking too much about the tactics of firefighting. So how do I apply the water? And what, well, a little bit, but not too much. So if we're talking about they, it will mean extinguishment. Good. Any other thoughts? Cooling capacity um, takes place at the right uh, uh, place. So, what kind of place is that, and can I uh, go to that place to uh, take the, the right cooling? Uh yeah. Do you mean uh, are the conditions in such a way that we can go inside the building to fight a fire? No, or to okay. put the water on the right place. To put the water on the right place. So you have yes. the smallest amount of more water needed mm -hmm. to uh, uh, succeed. Okay, so you want to know, should I put it on the seat of the fire or do I put it into the flames? Yes, that question, uh, not into the flames, everyone knows that, but what is the right place? Okay, mm, yeah, I might put it in somewhere. Um, thank you, um, it gives me a little bit of an idea what you want to know and, well, if there are any questions, just please ask them. Um, these are the things I want to talk to you about. Um, I first want to look at what kind of different methods uh, do we have at this day. Um, what's different about them, just to give an idea what's already available. Then I want to break it up and see what uh, the background of these kinds of methods. Uh, basic physics, chemistry, uh, full-scale fire testing, um, and also some statistics, fire statistics. We're gonna close it off with some simple rules of thumb. If you're going to the fight a fire tomorrow, those are the things you might uh, keep in the, the back of your head. So first gonna make it a little bit harder, and then we're gonna close it off simple. Um, we're also gonna talk about a lot we don't know, uh, because there's more that we don't know about fire and fire suppression than we do know. Um, and we're I will put that in somewhere in between every slide. Um, also, a little bit of demarcation. Um, I'm only going to talk about suppression with water, so no caps or anything. Uh, we're going to talk about building fires. I mentioned uh, I'm not going to talk to about too much about suppression tactics um, and also not the probability of suppression. I'm I'm going to say a little bit about it, but that's not the main focus. Um, the main focus is estimating heat release rate and how much water do you need and the theory behind that. Just an to give you an idea about different methods, um, there are a lot more. Um, also a little bit more complicated ones where you need a computer program and input a lot of parameters just to give you an idea. If you uh, put them on a graph um, with the, the fire flow, in this case in gallons per minute, 
Uh, this is specific for an uh, industrial building of 900 square meters. And, well, you see that there's a pretty much variation, but if there was to be taken some line, it should be maybe somewhere around here. Um, some uh, matters have a little bit of spread, uh, depending on how much ventilation, uh, ventilation openings, windows, uh, doors there are on the outside of a building. Um, but, well, maybe there's some kind of a line over here. And that's about 2,000 gallons per minute. Um, or in metric system, about uh, 7,500 liters per minute, or full 450 cubic meters per hour. Is that something that we find realistic? You're saying no? Can you explain why? It depends. Of course it depends. Do we have it available on our industrial sites? 450 cubic meters per hour. Same answer. Same answer? <laughs> ah, it's not going to depend every time. Well, in my own village, at least the fire hydrants, there's no way they're going to give me 450 cubic meters per hour. Maybe 150, but that's it. Um, then we have some other ways of putting water, of uh, transporting water to the fire trucks. That's going to take a long time. Um, and the next thing is, if I have a fire with a size of 900 square meters, 450 cubic meters per hour, that's what I need to fight a fire, they say. How the hell am I going to get it in an efficient way onto the fire? I don't think it's realistic to fight a fire that big, and I haven't seen much successful uh, suppressions in these big of a fires. Just an idea what the methods are telling right now. Another one uh, for a, a dwelling. Um, also, again, a, a little bit variation. Uh, the scale is not ideal, uh, but somewhere around 500 gallons per minute, you might see a line that says, well, that's, that's about in between the, the, the most methods. Um, 500 gallons per minute is about 2,000 liters per minute, so 110 cubic meters per hour. Um, in this case, for a dwelling of 140 square meters. Again, the question: um, Is it available in the? I'll come to you in a minute, Stefan. Is it available in the most residential areas? 110 cubic meters per hour. No. 60? Yeah, 60 cubic meters per hour, 30, at least in, in the Netherlands. It might be different in other countries, but America most certainly, but Stefan. Uh, the, can you back up one? Yeah, yeah of course. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that was, that was, uh, multi family houses, and the, the next one is single family houses. No, this one is non residential buildings. Okay, non oh, sorry, yeah. Okay. Of uh, 10,000 square feet, so 900 square meters. And this is a residential building, about 140 square meters. So the, there is a difference, uh, too. Um, these are things that I think that determine uh, whether or not so your suppression will be uh, probable. Will you be able to extinguish the fire? On one hand, the heat release rate and uh, the cooling capacity, the amount of water that you have available. Um, but also a big factor is, are you able to put the water where you want it? Um, and well, the last part is more the theory of predictable outcome from Ricardo, and we're not going to talk too much about that today. Of course, it's very important, also very important, um, what's the firefighter, what is his knowledge? Is he able to do uh, the extinguishment? There are a lot of factors that de 
mm, well, will determine a lot more how much water you will need than just the theory of uh, one liter of water converting into steam takes this much energy. But we have to demarcate it a little bit for today. So we're not going to talk about are you able to put the water where you want it. <coughs> These are some factors that I um, put up uh, and said, well, the heat release rate of a fire, how can you estimate it? Well, sometimes by area or the volume. Um, we've got some uh, tables for the heat release rate per unit area of a certain type of building. We'll see that in a minute. Uh, the fire growth rate, and maybe if you know how long the fire is burning. Ventilation, we've talked about it this morning. It is a really important factor. No oxygen, no fire. So um, you might have an industrial building of 900 square meters, but if there's little ventilation, you will not have a big fire that will involve the complete 900 square meters. But the potential is there. That's always to keep in mind. On the other hand, the cooling capacity, of course, the available flow rate is, is important. And also the uh, efficiency of suppression. Uh, can you get the water where you want it to? Uh, which tactics are you going to do an exterior attack? Are you going to do an interior attack? There's a lot of difference in that. Um, but also something I want to point out from a research uh, from 1959 by Iowa State University. Um, they did a, a, a lot of tests and they did an indirect fire attack. So they put the water on hot walls and creating steam. And they made it in a circular motion, um, as violent as possible to create as much turbulence. And they found out if they did it um, clockwise, it's much more efficient than if they did it counterclockwise. So it's just the way you apply the water makes a difference. And it, it wasn't a small difference. It was a big difference. So it goes into that much detail into knowing how fire suppression works. Would it reverse if you were suddenly? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody has that. Everybody. Um, no, probably not. <laughs> Frankly, I think that is bullshit, but that is my view. Yeah, because uh, before your, your presentation, I was at, uh, from uh, UL, and uh, the Z or the O doesn't matter. So it's, uh, okay. Yeah. It's like 1959. Uh, it's a True. kind of old research. Yeah. And maybe they used different kind of nozzles or different, yeah. Mm. But like, all the water you put inside, it's the same amount of water. No, it's, to, you always have to uh, look at how did they do the research and um, is it still realistic to take those conclusions into account. But uh, one thing is pretty important. Um, we've seen today a few times that we've forgotten some important things from history. And it's always good to look back at what knowledge was available 50 years ago. If I look at this uh, particular research, their knowledge about fire and fire suppression was very good. Um, and a lot of things I read in there are nowhere near what a volunteer firefighter in the Netherlands knows about suppressing a fire. Um, you can have questions, well, is this true? And we can have a lot of discussion. It's not my uh, point to uh, make you all, if you have fight or fire, take a clockwise motion. It's just my way of saying um, fire suppression is something that a lot of things come into mind. There are multiple ways of uh, fighting a fire and there are a lot of effects that take place in fighting a fire. It's not just the cooling effect, put water on the seat of the fire and the uh, amount of paralyzed gases will go down. It's also creating steam, maybe inerting. The steam can block the radiation from the, the hot smoke layer. There are a lot of things going on at the same time. And this example is just to uh, tell you it's a difficult thing. We don't know everything about it. Not about suppressing the fire and certainly not about the fire itself. Um, 
and most certainly not if we're going to combine ventilation with suppression or a lot of other things. There's a lot of fundamental research to be done. And whether it's still true that clockwise, uh, clockwise motion is um, much better than counterclockwise, maybe we have to be a little bit uh, harsh on that. Um, if you look at all the methods, they all come down to a, a single thing. Heat release rate versus cooling capacity. And those two have to match. If you have enough cooling capacity, you will be able to extinguish the fire. Pretty simple. I want to break it down now with a few things. First, we're going to do some basic physics and chemistry. Then we're going to look at some full-scale tests that are done and fire statistics. Just to show you some things, what the different methods are, are based on. Um, as I said, I'm only going to go into basic stuff about physics uh, and chemistry because a lot of the things we don't know. Um, calculating what inerting effect a certain firefighting tactic has, it's not really possible at this moment. Or if I could do it, uh, ventilation will have a much uh, larger effect than um, uh, impact on, on extinguishment, so I won't be able to calculate that. So we're going to mainly focus on calculating by heating up and evaporation. Um, that's the basic thing we can do right now. Um, if I have one liter of water and I uh, have a temperature rise from 20 degrees to, let's say, 300 degrees of steam, um, it will take about, about 3 megajoules per liter. That's the amount of energy it takes to convert it into steam of 300 degrees. And one thing that you can see is um, heating it up from 20 to 100 degrees, around 300 kilojoules. Heating up the steam from 100 to 300 degrees, about 400 kilojoules. So the main part that takes up the most energy is the evaporation of water. Um, if that's um, a thing that you're happy about as a firefighter, creating steam, that's another thing. But it does take the bigger part of the energy. If you put it into a formula, you get something like this. The 3 megajoule per liter times the flow rate. And we got X. Any ideas on X and what it depends on? Yeah. Efficiency of the firefighter, how is his knowledge about fighting fire? In which way does he put the water on the fire? Um, do you have any idea what X should be? Well, it should be one. Yeah, that's true. In the ideal world, it should be one. Um, but um, I should rephrase my question. In reality, it's, it's more like point one. Yeah. Give or take. Yeah. In, in research, you, you find some different figures for an interior tech. They say about 30% to 75%. Exterior tech, they go from about 10 to 30%. But I've also seen a video on Facebook of a guy standing outside nearby a shed with his hose pipe in his arms. And you just see his flow going right over the house. He's trying to, <laughs> to fight the fire. So he's got X is zero. Um, there's a huge variety of uh, what X is. And it also depends a lot on the, the firefighter itself. Um, we can spend a lot of time trying to calculate um, what X is, but then the firefighter comes into play and he's a more um, bigger variety on, on what X is than just only what way you put the water on. If we're going to go to the other side, uh, estimating the heat release rate, uh, in the Eurocode, um, the European document about um, calculating steel structures and uh, concrete structures, 
Um, in the national guidance in the Netherlands, we've got a, a table that says, well, if you have this kind of typical use of a building, this is the potential heat release weight per unit area. Again, ventilation is a big part of it. So uh, this is only the potential heat release weight. If there's only one door open in a thousand square meter industrial building, you will not have 500 megawatts, but a lot less. But it's something to keep in mind. Because if the roof will collapse, a lot more oxygen will be available and the heat release rate will go up fast. And if you fight a fire, you don't only have to think, I see this fire, how much water do we have to bring? But you also have to think, how big can the fire be? Uh, get while well, I'm fighting the fire and which safety factor do I have to apply on the amount of water that I bring. Another example, um, a simple couch. Any ideas on the heat release weight? Two and a half. Any other thoughts? Somewhat. I've seen somewhere between one and a half to an half me megawatts. The UL living room, we've seen it this morning. What's the heat release weight? Any ideas? Is that the first one or the second one? Uh, second one, sorry, this one. The second, second, the last one. Oh, this, this is the first one, but well, yeah. <coughs> Uh, Robin told us this morning the heat release weight was somewhat the same. I've also seen, well, somewhere around 10. In this case, actually, the cone calorimeter wasn't able to uh, measure more than 10, I, I believe. So it was a little bit more, but let's say somewhere around 10. Um, these are also the fires which I think we are able to extinguish. If you're getting a lot bigger, the first two the uh, figures that I showed you, I don't think we're able to fight these fires. Now we're going to look at the theory uh, behind the heat release weight. Um, and we had X in the cooling capacity, <coughs> but we also have a kind of an X on the heat release weight. Um, you've got different things that come out of the, the different researches. Some say, well, it's 30 to 35%. Some say it's 50, um, and I want to look at it in this picture. I've stolen the, the formula from Sartfist. We've got two sides here. The left side is the amount of energy that's taken away from the fire, and of, from the seed of the fire, and the right side is the amount of energy that's put in. The first factor, LV, is the heat of gasification. How much energy does it take to pyrolyze a certain amount of, of fuel? Um, QL are the heat losses at the seat of the fire. The surrounding air is most of the times uh, less hot than the object itself, so we have some convective losses there. And QW is where we come in. W from water, so that's the amount of energy you take away by suppressing the fire. On the other hand, the amount of energy that's put in, that's creating gases to pyrolyze from the, the object, um, this is the radiation from the flames. Um, normally, we say about 70% of the heat release rate goes into the an convective, into the hot uh, smoke layer. About 30% is radiation from the flames. The flames radiate back and they heat up the object, the fuel, so it will pyrolyze more. And the last factor is the external radiation, so the hot smoke layer can also radiate and heat up the fuel to make things pyrolyze. Um, this formula shows you that not all part of the heat release weight is put back into the fire to make gases pyrolyze. So that's why they say it's, well, in two different researches, somewhere between 30 and 50 percent. It depends. Be safe as a firefighter. Take enough water. Don't depend always on, well, it probably 30 percent. It might be something more. But it's also not 100 percent. That's the thing that's important. 
Um, to skip from the theory to some um, things that validate the theory. Of course, I'm not able to look at all the um, research that has been done, the full-scale test, so I've only got a few things. I want to look at the, the full-scale tests that are done at uh, Iowa 1959, a long time ago, and the fire statistics that Grimwood uh, gathered in the, in the UK. Um, the Iowa 1959 formula is pretty simple. They look at how much oxygen is available in a room. That's the amount of uh, heat release weight that can potentially be available. So that's on the, the right side. And on the other hand, um, how much heat do you take away by cooling and evaporating water? So that's on the left side. Simple formula. Uh, works great. Uh, Grimwood uh, made a new formula and he, um, well, compared them and, well, even 30, 40 years later, the um, outcome of the both formulas were somewhat the same. Of course, physics doesn't depend on if it's 30 or 40 years later. It's still the same basics, so they had the same outcome. They did a, a few hundred full-scale test, small rooms, um, indirect fire attack, as I told you, evaporating on the walls, uh, water on the walls. Um, and they saw that too much water was less effective. And they concluded from that um, water evaporation and inerting might be more important than just cooling. Again, I'm not sure what that does uh, on the ability to fight a fire, because steam might be uh, troubling for you as a firefighter, but that's what they concluded from, uh, from these tests. Something, in my own opinion, uh, they looked at the volume uh, of oxygen available in the room, and certainly in small rooms, the fire will be ventilation controlled pretty fast the amount of oxygen in the room um, will be uh, consumed by the fire pretty fast. So the heat release rate will most probably be, um, be dependent on the amount of ventilation and not necessarily on the size of the room. It might be for a big room, but not so, uh, necessarily for a small room. Um, I have to say they knew a lot about fire and suppression. I was impressed about their knowledge in 1959. To skip to some fire statistics from the UK, uh, Grimwood uh, put some flow uh, meters on the fire trucks in, uh, in two parts of, of the UK. Uh, you gather data from about more than 5,000 fires, so that's a substantial amount and the most uh, available today, I, I think. Um, he uh, looked at different building types also looked at the fire size, um, but I couldn't see if he looked at fire tactics. So did he do an exterior attack, an interior attack, and what was the influence of that on the amount of water that you uh, used? Also, the success of fire suppression wasn't analyzed, and we're going to see that in a, a table. Um, this graph has the uh, flow rate of water, um, and on the uh, x-axis, uh, the area of fire damage. On the, the bottom line is for residential uh, buildings. Uh, the upper line is for industrial storage buildings. And Grimwood also plotted uh, the Sartfish formula in between, uh, in the middle. In this case, if we take about 300 uh, square meters of uh, fire damage, we're going to go to about 2,500 liters of water per minute. If we're going to go back to one of the first graphs with the different kinds of methods, <coughs> you saw we had about 7,500 of liters per minute at an industrial building of 900 square meters. If we do 3 times 300, that's 900 square meters. 3 times 2,500, it's 7,500 liters per minute. So I think. Somewhere these methods are kind of right with 
actual practice. If uh, the 2,500 liters per minute means that they have uh, suppressed and extinguished the fire of 300 square meters, well, we can't get that out of the data. Did the fire die out uh, because it ran out of fuel? Or did the fire die out because of what we extinguished and how much water we put on it? Um, one other important thing here is um, these are averages. There are a few fires that were 100 square meters big and some they use more water than other. And that's what you can see in this next one. Um, well, to have the, the biggest one, it's about 6,000 uh, square liters per minute. And in the bottom it's, well, maybe only 60. It could be a factor of 100 difference with the same size of the fire. And you have to think um, as a fire department, if you want to uh, look at how big should my, uh, how much water should my fire hydrants deliver, um, on what scenario should I um, design my, the, the size of my fire hydrants? Do I want to be able to fight all the fires and go here on the top? Or should I be able to fight 80% of the fires? I don't know what's your opinion on that. Where should you draw the line and say, well, this is enough? Should you go take worst case and take 6,000 liters per minute? Or what would you do if you have the, the ability to design uh, the size of the fire hydrants in your uh, own village? Depends. Of course, always. Mm -hmm. But you have to make a choice. What's the budget? Well, it's a limited budget, of course. That's one of the, the problems, true. But still, if you have an unlimited budget, would you always go for the worst case fire? Or would you accept, well, that 1% on the top uh, will take me so much more uh, a, a bigger fire hydrant? We'd probably look at it from an English perspective. How would we justify it in court? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, of course. Risk. Yeah, yeah. So it's easier to answer the question if you pose it the other, the reverse way. But for us, it's easier to answer it. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Oh. Okay. Um, again, questions are raised. Uh, how big should your fire water mains, how much water should they deliver and what do you want to expect from the, the, the fire department. Um, in the Netherlands they always say, well, we come and we do our best, uh, but I'm not sure that that's a thing you should um, accept um, from the fire department. If I buy something at Amazon and they're going to say, well, we're going to do our best to deliver your package to you, I don't think as a, as a customer I would accept that. Um, and I think to further develop the fire department, it might be nice if we could tell people what we are able to do, uh, or at least try to uh, tell them what we are able to do and also what we're able not to do. So if somebody is building a new, uh, a, a new building, he knows uh, what he can expect from the fire department. And if he's building a building that we are not able to fight a fire, he knows that he should take some other measures. I think that's one nice step in further professionalizing uh, the fire department. But that's really implies. I think that's already there for certainly in the UK, Europe. They take into consideration there's three bits of this prevention, mm -hmm. don't have a fire, protection of the building and the people in it. And the last bit is a response when it all follows. Yeah, it's true. But, um, well, what I see is that uh, a building owner as, uh, expects from the fire department that you come and we're going to extinguish his fire. But it's not true for a lot of buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's, a, a, in my opinion, a pretty big gap to what a building owner thinks and what the fire department can deliver. And I think we have to talk about that. And if he knows what he can expect from the fire department, 
Um, if he uh, thinks um, continuously uh, operating, uh, even if he has a fire, um, then he can take some other measures. That's I think it's worse if you've got a lot of industrial buildings in one place and industrial is done. Because you only ever look at one building in isolation, you don't look at all the risks together and what they present. In general experience, I think, unless a building changes ownership when it's first built, there are some inherent fire protection measures in there. I think they're the yeah, it's all. UK, yeah, no, but uh, it's also something important. If if a building owner changes and uh, the way a building is used changes, it might be so that the uh, uh, preventive measures might not work as well as they should have. Well, of course, you have just seen that, that the, the Grenfell Tower fire, yeah. fire should have been contained to the rule of origin and wasn't. So yeah. there are some clearly it doesn't always work. No, it's true. Yeah, and that also changes then what you expect from the fire department. It's, yeah, it's connected to each other, it's true. It is. Yep. Um, I only don't, don't know if it's right to say it that way. Because if the package of Amazon is not delivered, then Amazon can say, we send you a new package. But if there's a building uh, burning, we cannot say we do it again. No. And, and because if we say um, your, your house, we, we can uh, uh, extinguish the fire, um, I don't know if you can say that, because the techniques and developments can so fast that in 10 years there's, there's a whole another uh, fire going on in the, in the same house. Yeah. So I don't know if, if uh, I, I don't think you can say that there's violence. Well, I'm, I'm not saying that you can promise what you can do, but I think we should talk about it because we know a lot of industrial buildings if they, there's a fully involved fire, we are not able to extinguish that fire. Yeah. That fire will extinguish because it will run out of fuel. But a lot of building owners, they still believe that we are going to extinguish that fire. And my yeah. point is we have to talk about that. Okay. And of course we're not going to promise that we are always going to fight a fire if it's this size or if you have these conditions, we can uh, fight a fire. No. But it's, I think it's something we have to talk about because yeah. building owners have another perspective than the fire department. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, this is another graph from the, the Greenwood uh, research. Um, on the right hand, you can see that um, the x axis, you have the area of fire damage in square meters, and on the y axis, the amount of, of the flow rate flow rate per square meter that is deployed. And you see that it goes down when the area of fire grows. Does that mean that the X in the cooling capacity goes up then? Or what happened here? Any ideas? The objectives have changed. Yeah. As I mentioned earlier before in this research, uh, they didn't look at, well, did they really extinguish the fire by putting on the water? Or did the fire extinguish because it ran out of fuel? Or were they even trying? Were they even trying? They might uh, change from an offensive attack to a defensive attack. Um, and if you uh, first look at this graph, you might conclude and say, well, you need less water if a fire is bigger, um, but it's probably uh, that they choose maybe another fire tactic um, or they just, well, the first few uh, pictures that I showed you, they did put some water on, but it didn't do all that much. So it's always thinking about what you see. Um, or it could be that, <coughs> we have, I mean, we don't, we don't put out 10,000 square meters at once. We take it out square meter per square meter. So, which means you have a, a lower flow rate in, in a, in a, if the fire area is smaller, you're probably overkilling it. You use more water because you mm -hmm. can reach all of it at once. In the larger fire, you have to take it bit by bit. So then you get a try to flow. take the time. Then you get a lower flow rate. And that's <coughs> the problem with one of your first slides when you calc with the calculations and you said that you get about three megajoules 
cooling capacity per liter of water. The problem with that calculation is that that assumes that you pretty much deliver the water everywhere in the room at the same time. We don't do that. We start at one side of the room and work our way in. So, um, calculating cooling capacity that way doesn't really, it, it works for a small room mm -hmm. where you can reach everything within a few seconds pretty much. The larger the room you have, or the larger the volume or the larger the fire area, then you have to put the fire out square meter per square meter. Yeah, if, if it's possible. Yeah, well, you still have to reach it, but mm. which means that you, for a larger fire, you pretty much, up, at least up to some point, you need a lower flow rate because you put out the fire bit by bit. Yeah, okay. So if you change, well, you have to change tactics because there's less water available and you try to focus uh, all the water on a small portion. Well, the amount of energy it takes to heat up and evaporate water is always the same, no matter how big the, the fire is, but you change your tactics and then... Yeah, you take it bit by bit, Yeah. instead of taking it all. So yeah. if you have a small room, you can take it all out at once, pretty much, but not all out. As your axis goes right, mm -hmm. area of fire damage, mm -hmm. there's, there's a massive factor of acceptable loss in that. So if we have a certain not exactly the same as your first pictures, but something of that severity. We're accepting loss and surrounding, yeah. yep. as opposed to something on a smaller scale, which would be much more offensive to try and, attack, and, and address and tackle. Yeah, sure. yeah but um, with an area of fire damage of 10,000 square meters, I don't think an offensive attack is, is realistic. Um, this is a figure from uh, the Paul Greenwood's uh, another research. Um, he says, well, if the fire is bigger than 86 square meters, we have a probability of extinguishment of around 50%. Um, what data is the background of that? Well, you can discuss about it, um, but I think, again, it, it does mean something that, well, a big fire, maybe more than 300 square meters, I don't think we've extinguished much of those by just putting water on it. Most of the time it dies because it ran out of fuel or we are able to stop it growing. So we use the water in a more defensive way uh, to not let any other thing catch on fire. But it's not really uh, extinguishment by suppressing and putting water on it. That's a different thing. And again, if it's 10,000 square meters, yeah, I think it's acceptable loss. It's also how you build your uh, own building. Uh, you make a choice about acceptable loss. That data didn't include outcome, did it, on your previous list? No. So, just a question about the fire damage area. Is that the beginning of the, or is it the total after uh, when the fire is extinguished? Or? This is uh, after the fire department left. And of course, there's a, 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 a difference in how big the fire was when they uh, arrived and how big the fire was when they left. And this specific case, the outcome of the fighting of the fire wasn't really taken into account. So you have this graph, but you can't see if, well, did it have effect uh, the way they were fighting the fire? And you also didn't see um, did they do an exterior attack, an interior attack? Was it offensive or defensive? So you're not able to get it out of these uh, statistics. Does that make Paul Greenwood's chart slightly dangerous? No, you just have to know uh, what conclusions you draw out of it. Yes, good point. Yeah. Mm. But because can you not say that they use uh, too little water? That's why it's such a large area of damage? Yeah, <laughs> uh, I think that might be a conclusion. If, if a um, fire is growing, depending on how large area it was when they yeah. arrived. If if a fire is pretty big when they uh, arrive, let's say more than 300 square meters, the building is a, a pretty big open building, so it has the ability to grow. Uh, I think you are not able uh, to put enough water on it on the right place, or. Um, 
it might not be available from the firewater mains, so you're not able to transport it fast enough, and then the fire will grow as big as the building. I think that's a conclusion you can probably say. You're a little bit... Oh, I don't like it. I don't like that job. <laughs> oh, because we are not able to fight these fires? Or? No, no, no. It just, I think it leads you into, a, uh, into making assumptions that are, would be a long way away from the truth, reality. Yeah. So Paul has already said on that previous list, he did not measure outcome. Yep. And yet that chart would have you believe that if you go to a job, if we taught our incident commanders to go to an incident where the square meterage of fire affected area is, is in those large figures, don't, then they don't need as much water. The reality is, tactics would have changed and people probably yep. just boundary called yep. just to make just to contain the fire to one location. Yeah. Which is which probably is the real story behind that. Yeah. To, you have to be careful about how you read this graph and interpret it, uh, the data. Mm -hmm. That's true. And we're gonna go uh, cool. Like yeah. As I said, we're, we're gonna go into uh, some more detail and then we're gonna end up with some standard rules of thumb, what we're gonna do well when we're gonna fight a fighter, uh, fight a fire tomorrow. Um, these are the, the, the um, rules of thumb from the Fire Service Academy in the, in the Netherlands. Uh, again, we have the same graph, how you can uh, estimate the potential heat release rate take the typical use of a building, the area which is involved in the fire, and that gives you an idea of, of the heat release rate that is potentially available. Mm -hmm. This graph, is it from the Netherlands, the Eurocode or the Netherlands Annex? Yeah, it's, it's uh, the national guidance from the Eurocode. So uh, in the Eurocode itself, I believe there's only one or two typical uses of building. Uh, and in the national guidance from the Netherlands, uh, there's this whole list that's used for uh, making calculations in um, strengthening the structures in relation to the fire. Another thing uh, about estimating the heat release rate uh, for small fires, some ideas of how objects, how big they are and what <coughs> heat release rate they will give. Also on ventilation, they have some uh, rules of thumb. Uh, every square meter of opening gives about one, uh, one and a half until three megawatts. Uh, if you open a door, about three to six megawatts. And if you apply door control with a person uh, holding the door close, uh, maybe even looking at uh, the color of the smoke, the amount of smoke that's coming out of the building, it goes down to one or two megawatts. So the guy at the door will have a huge influence uh, on the size of the fire that you may expect. Um, one important thing, uh, we often uh, go to ventilation controlled fires today. Um, windows are pretty stirred today, they not go out so fast, um, but always keep it in your head, they can go out. There can be a lot of oxygen available, so always don't think about the fire that you see, but also how big the fire can become. And um, if you choose which hose line you will take, keep the potential heat release rate in the back of your mind. These are some uh, rules of thumb for the, uh, a direct attack. If you have a high pressure reel, uh, 125 liters per minute, uh, you can extinguish your sofa. If there's a high pressure wheel with a higher flow rate, uh, you can, well, let's say, five megawatts or two sofas. And a low pressure hose, um, you can extinguish a living room. I'm not saying that you can't uh, put out the fire in the living room. With the high pressure wheel, it will just take longer and more water. The two and a half is in a relationship with time. Second, or? Yeah, it's megajoules a watt is joule per second, so it's uh, a yeah, so time you, dependent. So if you close the building, airtight, then you buffer some fire gases, mm -hmm. and if you uh, then you open the building, mm -hmm. then you have your calculation, mm -hmm. and if the 
if the opening stays the opening you choose to mm -hmm. protect the fire, then there's no problem. And in most of the times you can use high pressure. But if the if there is a change at the window window frame, then you have the then you have the biggest problem and the biggest uh, risk for the for the fire. And yeah. then you need the uh, uh, a high capacity, a cooling capacity. Um, yeah, um, I need to think where to start. Um, yes, if uh, a window goes out, there's a higher potential heat release rate. Um, but there's some more things in, uh, well, if there are some fire gases collected. Now, fire gases, they are potential uh, heat release rate, eh? they can ignite. Um, and ventilation, a lot more things can happen in that part. So fire is a little bit too complex to make a simplistic um, way of looking at it as you just did. Um, no, I, I think that the, the high pressure at the two and a half uh, mega mm -hmm. capacity, I think that's simplistic because 90% of the fires uh, we put out with a, with, a, with a high pressure hose. Mm -hmm. Yep, true. So maybe it's, uh, the, the picture is too simplistic. The, the yeah, the, the, these rules of thumb, yeah, they are most certainly simplistic. Uh, also because the, the uh, firefighters in the Netherlands don't have too much time training. So we have to give them simple rules of thumb. Um, and also you want to be safe in which uh, hose line you choose. Um, it's true, 90% of the fires you, you will put out with a, with a high pressure reel. Um, but it's also about the 10% and um, you want to be <coughs> home safe in, well, let's say 100% of the fires. Mm -hmm. So it might be uh, a better way to have uh, a reel with a little bit more flow rate. So you have a little bit of a higher safety factor on your cooling capacity. And that idea is also behind uh, these rules of thumb. Um, as I said, you are able to fight uh, a fire in the living room of 10 megawatts with a high pressure reel. Uh, it just takes you longer and it takes you more water. And also, if there's a, um, uh, a room that goes out, you're adding oxygen, <coughs> the fire will be bigger. So then you have to uh, take into account a safety factor. So, yeah, it, it's simplistic, but I think it's a, a good way of looking at it. And be safe as a firefighter. I want to ask you some questions, just to keep it simple. We've got an office chair on fire. Which tool do you use to extinguish it? Fire hose. Left or right? Left. Left? Yeah. Call the firefighters. Yeah. Then they have a call. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're my friend. I like it when they call the firefighters and don't put it out their sails. But yeah, most of you said, well, we're gonna use the, the left side. I think that's also uh, sufficient cooling capacity in this, uh, this case. The, the living room from uh, UL, the high pressure reel, 125 liters per minute, uh, low pressure hose, 450 liters per minute, or the I'm not sure what it's called. Monitor, thank you. Yeah. Or the monitor about 1500 liters per minute. What are we going to use? If Any it's ideas? The monitor, if yeah? It's available, why not? Well, sure you get it one thing is it's hard to uh, point the water at a fire. It's so <laughs> it's just not, not easy to, to hold the monitor and put the, the water in the right place. So that's, that's one thing. Um, also, um, water damage. Uh, you might use a little bit too much water than you really need. Well, I don't know if you really have to care about water damage if there's already so many damage by the fire. But it's always something to keep in the back of, of your head. You don't want to create more damage by extinguishing the fire than the fire has already done. But 
can we agree on well the, the, the high pressure wheel might be a little bit too low on the cooling capacity. Well, if we're talking that actual fire we mm. see in the photo, yeah. the hose trail on the left would be sufficient. Yeah, yeah but so. it, well, it will be sufficient, but is it the best choice? That would be more than efficient, but if that fire would be inside an apartment, a fully mm. involved room, I would go for the middle one, but what I see in the picture, the host rail is just fine. Can you explain the difference from you the middle? You don't need more than that, it's middle. But I think with a little bit of a higher flow weight, uh, you will need less water and you will have the fire out quicker. Yeah, but in that case, it's 125 liters per minute, is mm -hmm. sufficient. You still get two liters per second. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it, you're nearby the, the critical flow rate. It, it's about putting the water in the right place. Mm. Of course. I, I, I'd agree with that. If you did a chart with competence on it, if you put someone 100% competent with the hose reel, an instructor, mm -hmm. that would equate to somebody at maybe 50% competent with a, a, a low pressure. So we, we can teach people. We never, we, if we teach a, a, a sample of 500 people, they, we don't, they don't all achieve the you know, best 95% of what we mm -hmm. teach them. Yep. But then there'll be, at worst, 35% perhaps. Yeah. And then everything in between. Yeah. If you have a firefighter with a good knowledge, you're saying, well, we can go take, take the... So the previous... Yeah, the, the access, yes. It's, it's highly uh, dependent on the, the firefighter and... Uh, yeah, 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 competence. True. Okay. I've got one last uh, picture for you. Um, this is also uh, the, the, the second picture uh, from the beginning. Which would you choose? The monitor or, well, in this case, 33 fire trucks? Again, I think yeah. Stefan will be yeah, no. not, well, completely agree with me. This is a calculation if you want to take out I've calculated a thousand square meter of industrial building, a 500 megawatt fire, 20% uh, for X for the efficiency, then I would need 33 fire trucks. If I want to pull it out at once, if I want to take it bit by bit, part by part, if that's possible. I don't know, is there any experience uh, in Sweden, Stefan? In uh, taking out a large fire, no, bit by bit, it. part by part. We don't do it. It's 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 a total loss. So yeah, okay. We would so protect the exposure. So yeah, you, you go, you, you switch to a it's defensive a strategy. Yeah. I mean, you, you could probably put that one out as well, but you have to do it bit by bit, and you would still need quite a flow rate. Yeah, probably somewhere around I don't know, 800, 1500 meters. Minute from the top and you have to well you can do it in, in several ways this is going to be long okay. <laughs> take your time i mean you could you could do that from the ground as well but the problem would be to get water on the fuel so then you have to move you still would need quite a flow rate probably somewhere around thousand liters a minute mm -hmm. give or take and then the problem would be, how, how do you move the host line? You need a bunch of guys, mm -hmm. and you have to protect them on the way in, because they're going to ex be exposed to the heat flux from the flames. So it's, it's a more of a practical problem, but just from a sort of cooling capacity yeah, point from of view. Yeah, from a theory kind of view, you're saying, You can well, put it out. Yeah. Well, if we can reach the fire. Yeah, the put the water in the right rate, place. You can put it out. A healthy label of risk versus benefit. Yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> but the way he's doing it from the ladder, there's no point because he's he, he's not even hitting the fuel. No, so he's only hitting the fuel before he hits the fuel. So yeah. he can't reach what's actually burning. He's just he hits the flames. That's it. Yeah. And nothing's going to happen. No, it's true. And it, you know, as you say, you need a lot of water in yeah. one place. And then still you have the radiation from the surrounding flames that you're not doing that still 
heating up the, the fuel in that place. Yeah. So in theory it might be possible, but in practice it will yeah. probably it, it very be a, a total so loss. You, apply the water. you can eat, in theory you can get the water on it, but in, in practice you can't get the water onto the fire because you have so many practical problems around it. So that's the problem with it. Yeah. Yeah. True. The thing is, like, if you just let it burn, it will be fast burned out than if you really yeah. put water on it. Yeah, 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 yeah. true. That's the thing. And yeah. you, so you, ha you don't have yeah, uh, polluted water. Yeah. Of course, it's like politically, the people will say the firefighters didn't do anything. I know. That, no. That's the problem. But, like, yeah, but it, burn, well, it will be fast done. Yeah, actually. it's true. Um, we're uh, changing those around, I think. Well, in our communication, we are saying some different things now. Um, we are um, saying now things like, well, it's a controlled burnout. Uh, so we just let it burn and, and die out. Um, and I think the public is getting used to us that we're saying that. And I haven't heard yet that the public is saying, well, it's completely uh, idiotic that the uh, fire department isn't really fighting the fire but let it burn out. They're only saying that if, well, you have a, a fire which contains some plastics and it takes you more than a week, then it's a different story. But, well, I, I think most of the time it, it's... Um, we have to realize that the fire department can fight every fire. If it's bigger than a few hundred square meters, I don't think we're possible to fight a fire. Um, and then let it burn out is probably the best option. Take a defensive strategy, uh, prevent it to go any to go to another building. Um, let the smoke plume rise up. Uh, it has a, lo a lot of buoyancy, um, and it's better <coughs> than putting a little water on the fire and just making it last a little longer. To I think it's more efficient to put fuel than water. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you want to fight the fire with gasoline. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's uh, 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 faster, and uh, then you can. Uh, it's get, one of my personal fire. dreams, to be honest, but I don't know. <laughs> I've had several of these fires, and uh, I start with uh, uh, ordering a couple of cranes, or uh, what do you call them, to put down the walls. Um, so the fire lits up and yeah. open up the roof. Oh, yes. Open up the roof. Yeah. Uh, open everything up and everything burns up. And that's that's the quickest way to uh, fight this, these fires. Yeah. Has anyone ever asked you where you were when they started? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was at a camera yeah. last year, I think, in the United States, of course. Uh, there was a, this this presentation about the, the title was something about water water flows for firefighting whatever and it's like oh I got to see this and there was this guy older guy who has been working as a pump operator for many years and well first of all I was very impressed by his knowledge I was he was very knowledgeable so he, he explained in detail how and he had some actual examples from his from his career how he managed to, to pump, like, I can't really remember the figures, but we're talking like, like <clears throat> within 15 minutes, he could deliver like 10,000 gallons per minute of water from a hydrant to a fire. And he was impressive, his calculations and expla explains and everything. But I was sitting like, when the hell do you need 10,000 gallons per minute water, sort of, it's like, there were no discussions about why do you need that massive amount of water. It was more like he could do it, so he did it. Yeah. And I was impressed by that, but I wasn't impressed by, well, if you end up in a fire where you, at least in theory, would need 10,000 gallons per minute of water, we don't need that anymore because it's lost anyway. So. It was kind of funny with the presentation, but again, I was very impressed. By yeah. Great, but I mean, you have to a little bit think about what's the point in, in, in pushing water. I mean, sometimes we need to protect exposures, and in, 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 some, in some cases, we need a massive amount of water to do that. But to actually, actually put out the fire of a, 
a huge fire. It's like, it's 100% loss anyway. That's why we're having insurance companies, in a sense. Yeah. It's one thing we have to take in mind, what, what goals do we want to achieve yeah. by fighting a fire? And uh, what do we need for that? And um, that's maybe a, a, a nice um, step to bridge to, to the, 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 the last slide. Um, I think in, in the future it might be nice if we would know um, we need this amount of wire for this firefighting tactic. And if we want to achieve this, this is what we need. And if I have a discussion, if I have a, a standpipe in a building and they want to have a smaller standpipe, well, now we only have the guy with the big mustache that's saying, well, I, I think it's enough. And it might be nice for the future if we not only think it's enough, but we know it's enough. Or we know if we make it this much smaller, it has this influence on this amount of fires that we will be able to fight or not. Um, if we design a fire truck, do we need 1,500 liters of water to take with us? Or is it better to take 2,000 liters? And those are the things we have to think about for the future. And right now, we do not have all the knowledge available to make a good choice in those kind of uh, things. Um, I think the problem with that as well is the landscape's always changing. Yep. New building materials, yep. new technology, new processes. Yep. And fire engines are built to last for longer than just a couple of years. So in designing something today, it could well carry equipment that could be obsolete within two, three, four years time. So it's very hard to the fire service to keep up with technological advances and yeah. the social advances. Yeah. There, there's a lot of things changing, uh, but it, mm, well, to start with it might be good if we know why we made certain choices yeah, and it's yeah. uh, based on knowledge and data instead of on expert opinion. And yeah. if we also try not to forget what was the basis for our decision, then we can, if there are some future changes, uh, if people start stopped pulling wool in couches as a filling and sure. uh, change it into polyurethane, then we can uh, uh, see what influence it has on the decisions we made earlier. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, right now we are doing too much on expert opinion, and it might be a little bit more on knowledge and, and test data. Um, as I said earlier, we do not know too much about fire, how it really works. We do not know, well, too much about every effect of uh, suppressing a fire and uh, how they influence them all together. And most certainly if we combine ventilation and suppression, we still don't know too much about it. So we're going to do, need to do a, a lot of fundamental research, but it's going to take some time. Um, for the uh, shorter period to collect some new data and knowledge, I think just put a flow meter on every fire engine. If it goes back to the fire department, it goes to a data terminal and you can read out how much water we've used over a period of time. Um, we can ask the commander, how big was the fire when you arrived? How big was the fire when you died out? Uh, which fire te fighting tactic did you use? Um, what influence did it have on the fire? Did you really suppress the fire or did the fire uh, go out because uh, it ran out of fuel? Those are some pretty simple things to collect some data and it will help us design a fire truck, um, decide how big uh, a flow rate a fire hydrant should deliver. In, in the Netherlands, I, I would assume you, do, you have some kind of incident reporting system. So after you go back, okay. We're, we're, we're working on that. Um, as a commander, I had to fill out a, a form. Yeah. And we stopped with it about of two years ago. Um, and they are now looking at improving the fire statistics. Um, and well, these are ideas we have to think about in, in doing that. Uh, all I have to do now when I come from a, back from a fire is uh, put my uh, uh, signature that I've been there, uh, the address where I've been, and the time that I've been there, and that's it. Okay, well I had a second question, but that's not a nice <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> well, the second question would be, because we, we have an, an incident report system, and I'm, I'm gonna look at the a little bit. 
I'm not sure how much you know about the. You've been involved. No, you didn't do operation. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you mean in the new one? Not the new one, but the one we have at the moment, because. In the hand that's. Uh, yeah, we haven't turned into that yet. Okay. But okay. I mean, we we do have the field for filling in. We can make an assumption. How much water did we use? Yeah, but it's only that's an assumption. Yeah, mm -hmm. and there, I mean, there's, there's, you can fill in okay. how large was the fire when you arrive, how large was the fire when you go back home. Should we yeah. <laughs> so we, we do collect the data, but specifically the data on, on water flows, it's, it's like between, you know. There's a huge it's square around. Around. Yes, yeah. but at least we get a number. So we do have the data. Okay. S sometimes. <laughs> we have the same in Amsterdam. We have also the report system for uh, commanders yeah. and uh, for uh, investigators. And we have to uh, fill in the, the high pressure, low pressure, and use more than a tank or an a tank. So we collect the data. Yeah. In Belgium, in my fire department, we also do it, but the problem is then they don't do anything with the statistics. You know, okay. So we have the data, but you don't yeah. interpret <coughs> what it problem. means. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. At, at least you have it. I would be happy if I would have it, and I could do something with it. I don't it. agree by they always fill it in correctly, I don't think so. Yeah, the, the reliability of the person that fills in, yeah, that's really an, an important thing in fire statistics. But I mean, you need, how long, for how long have you been doing that? One year, or 10 years, or 20 years, or? <coughs> Two, three years, max. Yeah, okay, max. then I can see, because before you can, before you can actually, years. yeah, okay, but still, before you can actually do anything useful with the data, you probably need, well, five years would be an absolute minimum, but let's say 10 years and above, then you can start to see the trends and, and do something about it. It takes a couple of years to get the data, depending on how many calls you get. And again, the quality of people fill in the reports, which is not always perfect <laughs> rally action. I think this is a good time to conclude this workshop. We're uh, a quarter to five, so it's time to uh, have a drink upstairs. Um, if there's any question, uh, of course, you can still ask them. Maybe we can have a, a little chat about where to put the fire uh, if we're having a drink upstairs. I, maybe I can tell you some little part about it. I don't know if there's any burning questions. We can yeah, we can take it upstairs. <laughs> thank you for being here. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank, thank you for you. Thank you. everything you've also told me. And uh, let's go upstairs. Thank you. Thank you.